first of all, I'd like to thank the organizer and chairman for uh, uh, kindly inviting me to this very interesting and special meeting, particularly honoring Professor T.V. Ramakrishnan, so we call him T.V. So um, uh, when I was doing PhD here, so I, didn't I did not have much uh, uh, interaction with him here, but slowly I got uh, courage and talked to him about physics. Uh, um, so I had uh, uh, quite a few interactions uh, with him, and uh, I uh, rightly endorse whatever uh, Argo was mentioning on the felicitation day that you talk to him, you go to him, discuss with some problem, and you come back with several few new problems. So, so this has been the case always. So uh, he suggested few problems related to this LB theory doing this in manganites and so on. Maybe some of the things how the spectral function evolves close to farm level uh, across metal slurred transitions and so on. So we have been working on this. So um, uh, doing RPS, of course, I had the machine. Uh, for quite a few years, but the main problem is getting good quality single crystals. So that's the main issue. So we have been resolving, uh, and we have now in TI for a good group which is growing good single crystals. So we are on the course now. So, <coughs> so before I uh, go into the topic of this RPA study of calcium, iron, to arsenic two, so I thought that considering the uh, this uh, eminent group, uh, there is a very interesting work. On, uh, uh, on the correlated uh, system, a uh, condo problem, which we have been working extensively. So I thought I would briefly mention, I won't hold you back from lunch. So I'll take some time off from the uh, main topic and uh, I just uh, mention the problem. So I, to define the problem, I'll use some schematics for non-experts. So this is essentially a study in a, of uh, how the condo feature evolves and what is the role of spinorbid coupling in a system, uh, cerium to rhodium cobalt silicon tree. So these are the collaborators of this uh, uh, problem. So as you know, you have already had many talks on condo problems. So let me uh, redefine to recapitulate what we look at spectroscopically. So we know in a simple metal the electron moves very freely and the resistivity actually goes up if you increase temperature. So now if you have a, uh, this is a, I mean in a general 3D metal, uh, although schematically I have shown this array. So now if you have a magnetic impurity, what happens that when the electrons are moving, they find certain barrier, a huddle, and uh, it gets scattered. I'm not talking about the Anderson scattering here, but uh, uh, it's the scattering due to the spin, which uh, is uh, called condo scattering, where uh, the spin of the electron gets split, and uh, at low temperature, these contributions become much stronger, and you get a resistivity minima at lower temperature. Now, if you go to very low temperature, what happens that these conduction electrons, which have an extended states, they couple with this local moment, okay, which I have shown by this electron cloud with this, and uh, so in this case, what happens that, uh, uh, which is a strong coupling limit, which you call. So here the electrons, it's not a special uh, phase or special state that it created. What happens that this conduction electrons form an entangled state with the local moment. So um, this uh, local moment earns certain properties of the itinerancy, so the Fermi surface expands. So you have, uh, because the, uh, this local moment also contributes to the Fermi volume. So that's the thing happens, and if you look at resistivity in a multi-periodic uh, Anderson model, then you see that the resistivity goes down okay, at a below a certain temperature. So if you look at spectroscopically, what happens that uh, in a normal metal, if your conduction band is looking like this, this is the Fermi level. Now at a very high temperature compared to a temperature scale defined by Condo temperature, so um, uh, there is not much change in the density of states. But if you go to a very low temperature, because of this condo singlet formation, what happens that the, some of the electrons which are really coupled to this, they are not so dispersed anymore. And you see, start seeing a sharp feature at the Fermi level, which is called a because of the soon resonance or uh, condo resonance feature. So the special characteristic of this feature is that this intensity goes up if you reduce temperature. Okay. So uh, this uh, 
uh, scenario has been described uh, in various phase diagram. So, for example, I just take up one of them. So, in a periodic Anderson la lattice, so what happens that this this axis actually shows you the Kondo coupling uh, axis. So, if the coupling is very very strong, you have this non-magnetic feature where the Kondo singlets are formed and uh, the system behaves like a Fermi liquid. Of course, if you increase temperature, then a different behavior is seen. And if you are below a certain critical uh, coupling constant, then you get this long range order phase. Okay? Uh, so, this critical is called a quantum critical point. <coughs> You can, in terms of Fermi surface language, what you can talk about is that if this is a quantum critical point, here this side you have this big Fermi surface contributed by the local uh, local moments which because of the Kondo singlet formation and this is the small Fermi surface where you don't have Kondo singlets which is separated by this uh, line uh, and this is a quantum critical point. Now there are several uh, thoughts come up. I mean, depending on this uh, Kondo coupling, how it really behaves. For example, you can move this this line towards right. Okay, so nothing much really is happening. So what is happening is that you get this long range order phase and some uh, some space where you don't have long range order, but the moment is finite. Okay, but the interesting thing happens if you move this line towards left. Okay, so this has been described here in this phase diagram. So here you can see that if you if this line is moved towards left, so here you have a region where you do have finite Kondo coupling so and at the same time you have long range order. Okay. So um, uh, the, the interesting thing is that at the quantum critical point you have the Kondo temperature which is finite. Okay. So this uh, has been described uh, I mean, you can, you can think of this state as a spin density wave state, and this kind of quantum criticality has been called spin density of quantum criticality. So, most of the system that have been studied so far, so everybody talk about the local quantum criticality, it means that the Kondo temperature at the quantum critical point is zero. So, most of the systems that it shows. So, I will show you an example here. Uh, which where we find that actually the temperature is finite. That's the interesting point uh, that I wanted to mention. So this system, it has been studied quite extensively. This is this forms this uh, ALB2 structure. So where if you have cerium-2 rhodium silicon-3, which is this compound, it's antiferromagnetic, and uh, you can place this as the, at the peak of the Brunier phase diagram. And slowly you substitute cobalt at rhodium and you see the TN goes down in temperature. At certain temperature range, TN is very close to zero and you have this spin density of kind of a formation kind of jump uh, in resistivity. And uh, in the other extreme end, which is cerium to cobalt silicon 3, which is a perfectly uh, Fermi liquid system where the uh, resistivity goes as T square and uh, the Kondo coupling is I mean, complete here. So, and at x equal to 0 0.6, we see the resistivity goes as linear in T. Uh, so, this non Fermi liquid kind of behavior that we expect at quantum critical point. So, this is the composition that corresponds to it. Okay, so if we do photoemission on this, <coughs> so this one, uh, so here we show the same Heisman spectrum collected with different photon energy. So this black one is with helium 2, where the photon energy is 40.8 electron volt, and the red line is 21.2 electron volt. So we, here you can see the spectra, let's forget about the blue one. So, you can see that you look at the same thing with different photon energy. These are all angular integrated spectrum. And the spectral line shape, uh, the features, they are very different. So, photon emission spectroscopy, when we are looking at, we have to be really, very really careful because uh, uh, there are many aspects that one needs to think of. So, here what you need to really look into it is that uh, you are exciting an electron from one electronic state to another. So, this transition matrix element becomes very important when you are looking at the intensity of various features. So, photon intensity are essentially directly proportional to the transition matrix element. At helium 2, we, if we calculate, we know that the 4F contribution uh, in the photon cross-section is much, much larger compared to uh, helium 1. 
So this difference actually you can attribute to this uh, larger photoemission cross section of the four states. And you can take the difference between these two and find out the four contribution. Now if this is four then why do you get this two feature? Okay. So this is something which you can also explain schematically. Assume that uh, this is your uh, pharmacy and this is your 4F, uh, 4F energy level. Now this one electron of cerium, it can be in the 4F state or it can hop because it's very close to the Fermi level, so it can hop to the conduction mode. So we have two kind of states, F1 and F0 in the initial state. Now if you do photo emission, what happens is that this one doesn't give any signal corresponding to 4F photo emission because there is no electron in this. But this one, actually you can knock out this electron and you get this final state, okay? But since you are creating a hole here and we have a lot of electrons which can hop to this level, so they can actually screen this hole, okay? So this is called oil screen feature and the horror happens that uh, if this electron hops to this 4F band, so now you have to think of the spin orbit coupling, so this electron which has hopped to this band, it can go to, it can have different eigen energy depending on its total angular momentum J which is L plus S or L minus S, okay? So that has a different eigen energies and you can see that clearly there are two states which are there which forms because of that. So now if you have a condo singlet kind which can be think of like the, this, so this electron is entangled with this conduction electron C, you can see that this also gives these uh, two features, but since this electron is strongly coupled to this, uh, this state is strongly coupled to this, you would really expect that this uh, unscreened feature will be really negligible from this. Okay? So that's the thing. So what you do is that if you reduce temperature and if you see that the f intensity of this feature grows with respect to this, then you are sure that there is a condo effect. I mean, this is, the, this is a direct signature of this. So what we have done here, so we have taken the difference of helium 2 minus helium 1 spectrum and all plotted here at different temperature. So this is the condo co compound which shows this uh, family liquid kind of phase and you see that there is this feature which we call the condo resonance feature and this is a spin orbit coupling uh, state. Both of them they show temperature dependence and you increase temperature they goes down in intensity. Okay? Resolution? 1.4, 1.5 and all that. Okay. So um, uh, now you can see that at point 0.6 which is really at the quantum critical point, they also show sharp the resonance feature and this feature, these two goes down in intensity and this uh, one which shows long range radar that also shows these two features. The only difference is that this intensity, the quantum resonance feature intensity compared to the spin orbit uh, couple peak is much weaker. So that gradually goes down. That's the thing which is which we observed. So um, we can actually try to find out how this intensity can be evaluated. So here at same temperature we have plotted uh, the, the same peaks uh, at same temperature for different compound compositions and this is the symmetrized data to find out the condo resonance peak intensity at the Fermi level. Okay? So now what we have done is that, uh, so we plot the intensity of the condo resonance feature which is red and the spin orbit coupled peak which is this empty black cycles. So you see that all of them, you reduce temperature, they go, uh, they increase in intensity. Only the temperature dependence is very different. <coughs> if you are in the long range order design, then you see that this cold resonance feature is weaker compared to this. But if you are in the strong coupling design, then you see that this peak is stronger than this. So, and if we plot the relative intensity of this KRF uh, intensity divided by SOC, the spin orbit peak, you can see that uh, in this part of the phase diagram, they go up. So, because the cold resonance feature is dominant, but if you are within this long range order phase, then you see that they go down. Okay. So what we find that uh, the spin density of quantum critical that people have been thinking about for long, it can be found in systems uh, of this kind. What is it? Okay. Okay. So. Uh, 
Okay, but I can just use the pointer. It's okay. So this is the strong coupling design where you can see that uh, this intensity ratio goes up in the, if you reduce temperature and in this design where you have long range order, this intensity goes down. So what we find is that uh, this uh, combo coupling actually is finite within this long range order phase. But the spin orbit coupling seems to be stronger compared to the combo coupling thing, uh, strength when we have this uh, spin density of quantum critical So that's the point which I wanted to make. So, what substitution change the spin orbit coupling? Uh, we Actually, okay, yeah, it should change because uh, rhodium is 4D, so the spin orbit coupling will be stronger. Yeah. Okay. So now let's come to the topic that I wanted to talk. So the electronic structure of calcium iron to oscillate to, you know this uh, iron leak tiles have actually attracted a lot of attention recently. I mean uh, for last one decade maybe, uh, there are hundreds of papers which are coming out. So, and this system also has been studied quite extensively. Uh, so this work which we have done is done by, these are the columns. So this is the graduate student who is uh, instrumental for this kind of uh, studies. So he is the main person, part of his PhD work. And you know that photovision essentially requires many more people for the study. So these are the people who are, uh, so she is a postdoc who is now in IIT Mandi. And these are two uh, one graduate student and a JRF. And the single crystals actually are produced by this group, so which is, I mean, uh, they are really making very good crystals, so, uh, and we are able to get things done. Uh, <coughs> so, this calcium iron to arsenic 2, which is in this iron based superconductor family, uh, 1, 2, 2, so the structure is like this. So, you can put actually here calcium, strontium, barium, it doesn't matter, the structure is very similar. At room temperature, they are tetragonal. And uh, if you go to low temperature, there is a transition to orthorhombic phase. And at the same time, there is a magnetic transition. So it becomes a uh, spin density of kind of uh, uh, phase at lower temperature. Okay? So this actually is very robust. You can see that uh, now this is a specific measurement uh, done on the same sample that we have studied. So it shows a sharp peak. Although it shows very sharp, but actually it's a, uh, it has some width if you uh, expand it. So we not like a delta function, of course, but it's quite sharp here at the spin density of transition around 170 Kelvin. Okay, and uh, if you apply a 12 Tesla magnetic field, you see that this transition is not uh, affected much. So actually, this spin density of state is really very stable, and uh, the, the, this has been found. Uh, various magnetic susceptibility studies and so on. And resistivity also it shows, uh, uh, I mean, uh, quite uh, this micro ohm centimeter you can see from that uh, metallic behavior. Now you can of course dope this system by cobalt, nickel and so on and make superconductivity. But this uh, calcium iron to arsenic to this parent compound itself, it shows many interesting behavior. For example, if you apply a very small amount of pressure, it shows superconductivity. This is very interesting in the sense that even if you put europium here, and which has a very strong uh, local moment, and you apply a small amount of pressure, and uh, it shows superconductivity. So here, it has been shown the, by this paper that uh, if you apply a very small pressure, you can see that the PC goes up. And uh, of course, there is an interesting uh, structural phase transition. And uh, the PC is only maximum around, say, 15 Kelvin or so. And then again goes down if you apply much higher pressure. So here, you have this tetragonal to orthorhombic phase transition. In this region, you have a mixed kind of structural phase. So it's orthorhombic 
plus it's called collapsed tetragonal phase. So something, um, it's maybe tetragonal like, okay? And uh, the mean temperature goes down gradually if you apply pressure. So it's more like you can see that in the high TC cube phase, if you uh, compare, I mean, uh, with the typical phase diagram that often people refer to it is that you have to uh, vary certain parameter here and you go to superconductive dome. So it looks like that this calcium RM plus need to also reside somewhere close to this region. So that's, uh, you can give in an analogy. Okay, uh, so that's a thing. There's a huge coexistence of spin density wave. Yes, yes, yes. Which yes. is absolutely unlike the Okay, okay, that's fine. What I was thinking is that uh, I uh, I knew that this would <laughs> say, but what I wanted to say is that the uh, shape of the phase diagram looks somewhat similar, but any it doesn't matter. Okay, so uh, so what uh, uh, this this system has been studied uh, extensively by photo emission. So before I uh, present the existing photo emission data. Uh, on this system, let me give a brief introduction to uh, photons and technique, although all, all of you have uh, uh, had many talks on our pace. So it would help really to follow for the non-specialists. So photoemission, where we, what we do is that you shine a sample with some light, the electrons are excited, and you put a detector here, and you detect the um, kinetic energy of the electrons. So um, if this is your electronic structure like a valence band, coal levels and so on. So what it happens is that you put some photon of energy H2 and uh, the electron energy uh, increases due to the absorption of this H2 and you can see that uh, if you determine the kinetic energy of the electron which are coming out, so you can immediately map the, find out the binding energy of the corresponding electron that, that uh, comes out. So you can actually map the number of electrons coming out as a function of binding energy, uh, which is defined with respect to the Fermi level, always in spectroscopy, that's the way we define binding energy. And uh, the spectrum actually looks like this. So, the, which represents the occupied part of the electronic structure. The strength of this technique is that you directly probe the electronic structure uh, or spectral function of a system. Now, as I said that uh, earlier I referred that uh, since it's a quantum mechanical transition, so you have an initial state, you have a final state, so the photovision cross section of course depends on this transition probability, which is uh, uh, like a dipole kind of thing. And uh, the energy conservation and momentum conservation allows you to actually uh, find out the energy and momentum of this uh, uh, photoelectron that comes out. So what you do experimentally, you can see that if an electron comes out at a certain angle from the sample, uh, due to this uh, uh, lens and various electronics that uh, is used in this technique, you can exactly determine at which angle they are coming out. Because you can see that this red one actually can be mapped on uh, certain location of your detector. Okay? So depending on that, you can measure the angle. So once you know the angle, you can see that velocity or momentum is a vector, so you can find out the outer plane component and in plane component, and you know the kind of energy. So using these two informations, you can get this, uh, you can map the k parallel and k perpendicular, k is the reciprocal lattice vector uh, using these relations, okay? So here you can see that if theta equal to zero, so your k parallel becomes zero, and k perpendicular, uh, you can see that it becomes like this, you can plus v zero, which is the inner potential. So uh, at normal emission geometry, you actually change the photon energy, that means you change the kinetic energy and you can actually map the KZ vector. So if you change the photon energy, you are mapping uh, KZ and of course at a particular energy you can change the angle and you get these two vectors to map the uh, the band structure of any material. Okay. So this calcium iron to arsenic 2 has been studied, as I said extensively. I just uh, 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 quote this paper where you can see that uh, this is the k vector which is k11 by 0 direction and this is the gamma point and uh, you can see that there are uh, appears to be three bands alpha, beta, gamma. Alpha is close to the, it crosses the Fermi level close to the gamma point and you have this beta and gamma band 
and this your um, x point comes here almost x is the Villanovian boundary along this direction and one thing you can see that uh, at a low temperature I think uh, about 15 uh, I will check the temperature later uh, uh, so at low temperature which is within the spin density of phase okay so you can see that if you change the photon energy that means if you are changing the KZ vector, that's the thing which I mentioned earlier. So what you are seeing is that this alpha band, which was crossing the Fermi level, actually doesn't cross the Fermi level anymore. Uh, the beta and gamma, of, of course, they cross. Okay. So that this shows that uh, this uh, these uh, bands actually they have a KZ dependence. So we know that this. Um, uh, uh, one to do this iron arsenide family which shows the conductivity, they are effectively having a 2D kind of electronic structure. Okay? So the Fermi surface is supposed to be like 2D, but uh, uh, here you can see that, uh, I mean 2D means that it's a cylindrical kind of Fermi surface, so if you change KZ vector, it should be vary. Okay? So you should see similar kind of uh, Fermi surface, but here it, it varies uh, with KZ. So the whole Fermi surface which has been mapped here, and you can see that although it shows a kind of a, a cylindrical kind of structure, which uh, has been schematically shown here, the same band structure around the gamma point, but you can see that some of the bands, they show some kind of a de deviation from the 2D kind of structure, and uh, which are these black ones, okay? So the alpha band somehow deviate from this 2D, effective 2D kind of structure. That, uh, so if you look at this different K, so this is the, uh, this numbers that you see at the left, here, these are essentially 14 pi by C. So if your C is the C axis, okay? So 2 pi by C should actually give you a gamma point translation, okay? But here you can see that actually uh, you need to get a similar point if you want to get, you need to translate in the KZ vector 4 pi by C, okay? So it means that your Gullivergen somehow become doubled. So this has been explained in this, although the unit cell is like this, so you have two iron arsenide layers here within the one unit cell, this is your C axis, okay. Since these two symmetry are very different but the electronic uh, structure is somewhat similar or close by, so here what we are seeing is that actually your C is essentially C by 2, so your the your Bunoagen actually boundary shifts to 4 pi by C. Okay? So that's the periodicity that you see. Now if you look at the room temperature spectrum, which is uh, shown in the same paper, and you see that the Fermi surface actually looks uh, uh, very, very cylindrical kind and uh, effective 2D. So in this paper, whatever they say, that uh, this has been shown very clearly here, that uh, you change the photon energy here, and uh, at low temperature, what you see is that this X point, the Fermi surface shape, looks somewhat similar in all the cases, but at gamma point you can see at 35 degrees it's quite bright. You can see that and it changes at 60 degrees you can see it's very different, okay? So the, the thing is that the Fermi surface or Fermi, uh, so we have many uh, Fermi surfaces, like three Fermi surfaces around gamma point as well, and uh, all of them, they are not behaving similarly, okay? That's the thing. So since this shows uh, spin density of kind of transition, so people think that there should be a nesting vector which is responsible for this spin density of phase. And the nesting vector essentially proposed to be between the Fermi surfaces at the gamma point and the X points and so on. But you can see the scenario becomes quite complicated uh, uh, by seeing that the dimensionality of the uh, Fermi surface changes. So this one also shows here in this plot. So you can see that, uh, okay, this is the 40K data that I, so you can see that uh, at 16 pi by C, the bands are crossing at room temperature, but it goes below the, this is the alpha band. And uh, at 18 pi by C, you can see that they are crossing uh, at all the temperatures. So the, the, uh, the pairing or negative ordering, uh, whatever, uh, is happening in this material, in this material uh, seems to be associated to a nesting of the Fermi surfaces uh, between different Fermi sheets. 
and uh, it, it appears to become more complicated because of the change in dimensionality. That is the main message in this, uh, in this paper. So what we want to do here in, in this material, as you can see that it has been studied extensively. So what we wanted to do is to look at the spectral evolution very close to gamma point along certain k vectors and see the character of various bands, how the electronic states which are involved in various uh, transition that we see. Okay. So the <coughs> machine that we have uh, used for this study, which is built in TIFR, uh, uh, so this is the machine <coughs> and it has a resolution, uh, very good. So often when we do our test study, angle visual photoemission, we need to uh, make the resolution somewhat poorer to improve the signal to noise ratio. So here what we have done is that when we do helium one study, where the photon the intensity is very high, so we have tried to maintain the energy resolution close to 1.5 millivolt, uh, sometimes 2 millivolt, but when we do helium 2, the resolution we have uh, reduced, we have made it worse and it's about 10 millivolt, okay? so by changing the suitable conditions. <coughs> okay, so first I wanted to uh, uh, look at as you know that these nictites have been uh, described as Hund's metal, I mean that uh, electron correlation is not so important. So we wanted to look at the core level spectrum a uh, little carefully because uh, you know that uh, um, if you have electron correlation, so you know, normally you would see a lower half signature of lower hover band when you look at the valence band spectrum. Okay? But sometimes if you have many electronic states they are contributing, you have bonding, anti-bonding features and so on, it may become very more more complicated to really look at the correlation in this feature for the lower hover band. But core levels can actually help in this matter because when you do core level spectroscopy, as I was talking about the screening in the so photoemission spectra is essentially driven by the uh, final state effect. So because of the screening, you can have multiple features and they can appear at different energies because of the finite correlation. Normally, if you don't have correlation, you don't see uh, these satellites that we talk about or the energy for this poorly screen and uh, uh, oil screen features are not similar. So here, we have tried to look at various core levels of this uh, material. Okay. So you can see that uh, arsenic 3D, uh, it, it shows this multi, uh, two peaks kind of structure due to this spin of its splitting. This is 3D 5 by 2, 3D 3 by 2, but they are nicely uh, uh, showing some asymmetry which is typical of a metal, but they don't show any satellite here. Here also, uh, if you change temperature, you have seen that they remain almost identical. Now you look at iron 2P spectrum. So in calcium iron to arsenic 2, you can see that actually it's typical like iron metal, there is no signature of satellite which is seen. If you change temperature, then you also see that we have shown it uh, by expanding this region and you see that absolutely no change with temperature. <coughs> so what one can conclude from this is that I mean, whatever theoretically has been predicted that the electron correlation is not so strong in this uh, in these materials. Okay, so now let's look at the band structure. This is a simple LDA because the correlation is not so important. So one can directly correlate this um, uh, band structure to the photoemission spectrum, which has been apparent here. So uh, these are various bands from simple LDA calculations and uh, the width of these lines actually represents the iron 3D character here and here is arsenic 4P character, okay. So you can see that close to the final level, the energy bands have strong iron 3D character but it's finite at higher binding energy too. And here you can see the energy bands in this energy region have strong arsenic 4P character. So this in immediately shows just by looking at them that uh, there is a strong mixing of iron 3D and arsenic 4P. Okay? So the covalency is really very, very strong in this material. So that's the thing which you can see. Now you can actually look at the energy bands which I have seen shown as alpha, beta, gamma. Five minutes? Oh, okay. So alpha, beta, gamma, okay, I have not shown, uh, okay. So um, you can see that uh, 
the, where this iron 3D Z square actually appear at uh, around this energy range, and this alpha beta gamma, which is coming here close to the gamma point, uh, there actually you can see this one alpha, this one is beta, and this one is gamma, and they have different uh, uh, orbital characters. So the 3D XY actually is dominated in gamma, and uh, alpha is, uh, you can see here, strong uh, B, X, Z, and Y, Z, and uh, beta band has some finite contribution from 3D experiments y square. Okay? So these are the orbital characters that you see. And of course, you see that our arsenic P also contribute here. Now look at our RPS data. <coughs> I have not drawn any line here just um, uh, to show the raw data here. Of course, we will uh, carry on continuously. So here you can see that if I do the plot the MBC, okay, my momentum distribution curve around 100 millivolt. Okay, you can see that these are all room temperature spectrum. So the features may become a little broader compared to the low temperature spectrum that you have. So which I'll show very quickly. So you can see that there are three bands which are there, and the K value seems to be very similar in helium one and helium, helium one and helium two, but the intensity of these features are very different. You can see the alpha band is very strong in helium 2, but uh, the beta band and the gamma band is much stronger in helium 1. Okay? So this shows that uh, there is something which is happening here, uh, the, this photon energy dependence may be, um, uh, you have the three bands at same K value, but uh, the photon energy could be uh, dependent, uh, the photon is cross section could be playing some role. So uh, I don't want to, uh, so I'll quickly come to this point here. Uh, if you look at the photoemission cross section of iron 3D and arsenic 4P, you can see that at 21.2 UV, they are almost similar. But if you go to 40.8, iron 3D is uh, much stronger compared to arsenic 2P. Okay? So it means that at helium 2, you are essentially enhancing the iron 3D character. But if you are looking at, at lower temperature, arsenic 4P becomes uh, significant. So that means that uh, the feature that you see here, this alpha band actually has, uh, which is very strong in helium 2, has strong iron 3D uh, character. But the beta and gamma, they have significant P contribution. So that's the thing. So it's not a purely D kind of states. Uh, as you know, of course, the covalency is quite strong, important here. Now you look at the temperature dependence. So here we have shown helium 1, maybe I'll show the both of them, helium 1 and helium 2. So these are the raw data. And here we show the <coughs> spectral density of states. So you have this RPS data derived by Fermi distribution function. So that gives you the spectral density of states. You can see that these two bands, that is quite uh, well dispersive, it, uh, it becomes more like this. And uh, you can, uh, I don't know if you are able to see the lines here. You can see there are two distinct bands which are coming up. Here, of course, at 10 Kelvin, you can see these two bands very clearly. But in helium 1, these two bands are appearing little away from the gamma point, as we have seen in the uh, earlier <coughs> data. So that means that beta and gamma bands are much stronger, and alpha band actually you don't see here, which is much more visible in this helium 2. And uh, if you reduce temperature, you can see that these two beta and gamma band are quite distinctly seen here. So the, uh, uh, what, we are, uh, what we can see here, okay, maybe it's much more clear here, you can see that in the helium 2, where we see the alpha band, which is very, very strong, actually uh, this, this is the alpha band, which crosses the Fermi level. But if you go across the uh, spin density of transition, which is happening at 170 Kelvin, uh, you can see that this band actually has come below the Fermi. So the band moved below the Fermi level, okay? And which gradually moves much below uh, here at 10 Kelvin, okay? And the second band, which is not so significant, uh, so not seen so much here, which is actually clear in the uh, helium one, you can see that that also moves um, uh, uh, with reduction in energy, uh, sorry, the reduction in temperature. And here you can see that almost this is, uh, this second beta band actually had come very close to the uh, family. Okay. So we have uh, uh, done some anal intensity analysis here. <coughs> this is the most uh, uh, important uh, plot that you can see. This is the angle integrated data with very high resolution. 
So <coughs> very high means 1.5 millivolt. So in helium 2 and helium 1, you can see that across the spin density of transition, the spectral light at the Fermi level, there is a sharp change. Okay, And if you go much below, at lower temperature, you can see that another deep uh, pseudo gap kind of things which appears, okay? which is uh, not supposed to be there in this calcium iron to arsenic 2, okay? because it doesn't show superconductivity. And uh, which is also quite clear in helium 1 also, but it's much more stronger here. Here we have done uh, MDC plot at the farm level at different temperature. So in helium 2 you can see that uh, the intensity here which was strong due to the alpha band goes down in intensity if you go to 150 Kelvin. But again it becomes much stronger uh, because you can see that the second band which was the beta band actually it moves towards the thermal level if you reduce temperature and uh, so probably the pseudo gap actually is re responsible due to the beta band but the gamma band doesn't move here and which is much more clearly visible in helium 1 spectrum you can see this is the beta band it shifts to this peak uh, and uh, at 10 Kelvin uh, it appears close to the thermal level okay so if i plot the energy density uh, at the uh, gamma point which is uh, gamma 0 plus minus 0 0.01 that's the k value you can clearly see there are two peaks this is the alpha band which uh, peak above the Fermi level and it goes down below across the Fermi level uh, if you go across the magnetic transition temperature and it goes further below the second peak which is the beta band probably moves and comes very close. So you can see that the pseudo gap that we are talking about is actually uh, happening in the beta band which is different from the alpha band which is responsible for spin density and transition. So. The other thing which is happening is that you can see that the bands which are is quite sharply dispersing uh, with, uh, uh, so you can see that they are very, very, I mean, flat like this. It becomes like this if you go to lower temperature. So it means that their dispersion becomes, I mean, they become less dispersive if you go across the uh, spin density of transition. So less dispersive means the effective mass of the uh, particles would really increase because uh, the B decay, uh, of course, will change. So we have uh, estimated the effective mass for different things. And you can see that if you reduce temperature, they actually show an increase in trend. But uh, we don't see a, a change between 10K and 150 k So this change in effective mass is actually happening across the spin density of transition. But it remains almost similar at uh, lower temperatures. Okay. So in summary, so the, uh, what we can conclude from this kind of study uh, is that uh, the correlation induced features are not really visible in this kind of materials like one doesn't see the raw upper band or the correlation induced satellites in the core levels so um, which I mean re-emphasize the uh, I mean uh, more importance of the J rather than U that has been talked extensively uh, recently and the SDW phase actually involves uh, the movement of this alpha band which has DXZDYZ character and it has less covalency that's the thing which we found because uh, arsenic P is not really so strong and this has been visible in helium P very strongly but pseudo gap that uh, if we call that a pseudo gap it appears in the beta band which has a strong covalency okay and it can have a dx square minus y square symmetry in addition to dxz and dyz that we found from band structure result okay so the other things i just wanted to show this picture, picture of this spin visual photoemission spectrometer which has been recently built into IFR. i mean not it's set up essentially and uh, it's operating so slowly we'll be uh, starting to use this, we have been, uh, uh, we have started working on these topological insulators in addition to uh, the slip tides and so on. So uh, there are many things which are in the queue. Okay, thank you very much. C axis probably. Oh, 
Oh, oh, sorry, not C. I think it's uh, okay. I don't know the detail. I don't remember the details. It could be. I mean, uh, uh, they keep the volume same and like. Uh, sorry, hydrostatic pressure. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, hydrostatic pressure. Yeah. So it's from all directions. Okay, I just go. I think if you apply pressure on it, uh, we have seen that the structure actually is okay. The common thing is that you change the uh, lattice constraint, so the uh, I mean covalency will change, the hopping uh, parameters will change. Uh, but in this case, I mean they have studied the structural parameters. Uh, uh, extensively, okay, not this. I think here. Okay. Which minima we are talking about? This one? This is, I mean, there is no, okay. You can say that this is flat. This is actually structural transition temperature, okay. So at this temperature is tetragonal, okay. Where A equal to B, but not equal to C, okay. All the angles are 90 degrees, and here it is orthorhombic. Now, okay, you can see that it's almost flat here, we would say, and then this transition temperature goes up if you apply pressure. So, but here, this phase they call it collapsed tetragonal phase. I don't know probably uh, what it means. Uh, uh, but uh, initially it was orthorhombic, then it has a mixed structure. And then it has a um, uh, collapsed tetragonal phase. But the mean temperature, which has been shown here, this one is the mean temperature. So that goes down. If you, yeah, this is a part law. Okay. So this triangles. So if you increase pressure, this goes down gradually. And of course, uh, in this region, you have the TC, which is high. Then again, further it goes down. Yeah, yeah I think so. Yeah. So can you give us some simple physical picture of? Uh, connecting the Q vector, the spin density wave to some nesting vector that you found in a surface, or there is no such simple No, no, actually there, there have been a study, I mean people have already found the nesting vectors, so which connects the Fermi pockets around the gamma to the Fermi pockets around this X point and so on. Okay. Yeah? The nesting. So then the next question is that if you yeah. look at that, the states which are connected by nesting, is yeah. that when you saw the suppression of spectral weight? Can I think uh, of the difference between the gap? Okay, I did not think uh, that seriously, but I think it's not. Because the, because, okay, the, I have to check that carefully. I, I don't remember, because you see the spin density of that has been happening, which is, I mean, of course, consistent with the other thing also, that is the alpha band where the Fermi pocket, pocket vanishes. I mean, the alpha band which was crossing at the gamma point, uh, and near the gamma point it was crossing the Fermi level, it doesn't cross anymore if you go uh, below the mm, transition temperature. So the Fermi pocket vanishes uh, there already. So of course that nesting vector, I mean, uh, you know that hot line, so. But I don't remember which one uh, really they connect. But uh, there is a paper, maybe I'll find out. Yeah. When you say that, uh, Listing is important and it's not strongly correlated. But there are two striking experimental evidences in this family. In uh, one of these systems, the spin moment is more than one whole magnet mm -hmm. And uh, if you take out the number of carriers of the whole electron pockets, you can't polarize them and have such a lot. <coughs> so this is why we mm -hmm. Second, in this vacancy ordered potassium intercalator, I am selenite family. Mm -hmm. Which is almost the same family, quantum chemistry. Neutron scattering shows spin two moment. Okay, that only three point five four megahertz. Okay. So there is no way of explaining that by Okay, one thing you can only say that, I mean, this, you know, this people talk about this nictogen height. Okay, nictogen height in the sense that the height of the, uh, this arsenic or selenium, whatever you have, 
from the iron plane. Okay, that's an nicotinide. So in iron selenide, iron telluride, whatever we are talking about, in that the nicotinide is larger. So the separation is larger. So people think that it's less covalent. But you can't, you can't change strong carbonation so easily by small. Uh, no, but I think the. Okay, yeah, yeah, that's. I have a feeling that, have you seen any uh, uh, linear dichroism or, I mean, X-ray linear dichroism? No, no, I have not seen it. Yeah, it could be, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Because the surface magnetism is not always the same as the pump magnetism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, so, uh, but these are anti-ferromagnets, they cannot do yes. circular dichroism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But with X-rays, you know, linear, yeah, sure, sure. They the have linear. sensitivity to the magnetic mm -hmm. state, so. Some sort of linear I don't think people have done, but maybe one could. Yes, sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.